What I'm trying to do is to shed, share some stories about the cyberneticians in Spencer Brown's life. I don't think he wrote the fourth volume of his autobiography on becoming a legend. <laughs> I wonder if he could spell hubris. <laughs> Yeah, um, which I have. But, uh, but, but he didn't get to four. He, did, he didn't get to three or four. Okay. <laughs> I didn't know there was going to be a four. Yeah, I don't know where I've got that from, but it's, uh, it's in I'm my not, notes. I'm not surprised, nevertheless. So in 1960, Stafford Beer was musing with his daughter, me, about what to do about an employee whose work had become inadequate. We sat by, side by side on a sofa by a fire, and I think Stafford may have been thinking out loud. He said that a man in his office, when asked why his professional performance had fallen off, had said to him, how can I work at all after I've seen the bars of the electric fire melt all over the floor? So we both looked at the fire and thought, mm -hmm. <laughs> So I have no idea how Spencer Brown and Stafford met, but I do know that Spencer Brown worked at Sigma, which was science in general management, of which Stafford was the managing director from 61 to 66. Stafford had advertised for a multidisciplinary team in the Sunday papers and netted an interesting haul. He took Spencer Brown into Sigma with credentials from Bertrand Russell, uh, which subsequently rather baffled him as they were so fulsome. He told me that he thought uh, uh, Spencer Brown was the natural son of Russell. So I was young enough to have to ask what a natural son was. Because <laughs> he could have been, you know, the intellectual inheritor. But, but um, I learned that children could be born out of wedlock. So <laughs> Stafford was being quite specific. Um, yeah, so uh, this happened, I think, in the family home in Weybridge and Surrey in the 60s. So Stafford was very pleased at the notion of employing Russell's love child. He ha I have no more information. He regarded his employment of Spencer Brown as sponsorship in order that he could write the laws of form. Sigma staff were encouraged to take sabbaticals to work on a project, provided that it had nothing to do with work. Presumably, this is how Spencer Brown's writing could be accommodated. So, who was Professor Spencer Brown? Gloria Gillett, anyone know her? She worked at Sigma when a David Spencer Brown was there. They worked together on a contract together. Sorry, they worked on a contract together, but as it was for the Ministry of Defence, she feels she can't talk about it still, you know, 50 years on. He specialised in statistics, she writes especially in relation to traffic movements. Though this was not, she says, part of the MOD work. She says he was rather strange. John David yes, strange. David was rather strange. Jonathan Rosenhead, who's also at Sigma at the time, calls him socially inept to the point of being absent. <laughs> and neither of these people knew him as the author of Laws of Form. So Stafford left Sigma and joined IPC, which was then the largest publishing outfit in the world. And Spencer Brown came too. Now, John Williams, hello. He, po he posted a letter yesterday that Spencer Brown wrote to R.D. Lang on IPC notepaper, which is the only verification I've got of this, apart from my memories. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, from the Feltham office, which was my papa's um, base, you know. So that was, that was wonderful to see that. It's all true. Um, as, as, as a point, I think that Maxwell was calling himself David, which is also his brother's name, at that time. So, so um, yes, so the, just so, to... So there could have been two David Spencer Brands in, in the same... Uh, <laughs> or, or none, yes. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, um, Spencer Brown then has followed Stafford to Sigma. Stafford's employed him. Um, he did no work for the company for some time, and Stafford said he had to leave his employee. Spencer Brown said he would sue. So they both went to lawyers and were told there was no case. This did not impact on the tenor of Stafford's review in Nature, which called it a work of genius. We are introduced to an algebra of the utmost simplicity which a child, if he were thus sophisticated, could understand, and to a notation of great beauty, because it conveys what it says. 
Okay, I've done the wrong thing. Here we go. So, during the time at Sigma, Spencer Brown was fed and housed by the cybernetician Gordon Pask and Elizabeth, his wife. Gordon Pask was one of Stafford's closest friends. I knew him all my life. I happened to be sitting in their kitchen in Clapham many years later when the phone went for Gordon and Elizabeth took the call. On hearing her voice, Spencer Brown, for it was he, said, sorry, I've forgotten your name, and asked for Gordon. She was incensed. I wouldn't mind, she said, but I cooked for him for six months. <laughs> Gordon added his rec recollection when he came off the phone. He said, when he bathed, which wasn't often, he used my gin to wash in. <laughs> you can see the sense, actually. He's alcohol. It cleans the skin. But, but it's funny. We've heard since that he spent a lot of time in the bath. But yeah, Gordon yeah. was very clear in those yeah. days he did not. Yeah. Oh, no, he spent a lot of time when he was in it. It's just that he didn't have that much time. Oh, he didn't have that much time. Oh, yes, OK. Yeah, that ties in. So then we have uh, the first edition, which is by George Spencer Brown. The hyphen appears in subsequent editions. Uh, and then we have, um, according to the preface of the 79 edition, signed by George Spencer Brown, 79 edition, DJ Spencer, Br Spencer Brown had written in 1961 an effective algorithm for four-colouring any plain map which George Spencer Brown did not discover in his papers, DJ Spencer Brown's papers, until after his untimely death in 1976. But he was able, with some difficulty, to reconstruct the arithmetical operations on which it is based, and thus to complete what unexpectedly turns out to be the first proof of the four-color topology problem. In the preface to the first American edition, George says that my brother and I had been using Boolean counterparts in practical engineering for many years before realizing what they were. He mentions DJ Spencer Brown again in the introduction of the 77 edition. It's not possible for me to decide which of the Spencer Browns work for Stafford, but George, I think, once told me that his brother was a tax avoidance construct. <laughs> Though, that may have been Richard Leroy. So, a cursory genealogy, a research of the genealogy sites, reveals that neither George nor David were born in Grimsby in 1924, as claimed in his autobiography, Volume 1. In that book, we are told that Madge Featherston married George Brown, produced both George and David John, separated by four years, that the senior George Brown's mother was one Ellen Spencer Lee, her father being Thomas Lee. At some point, Spencer Brown acquired the middle name of his grandmother. And I can't find out why without hanging around archives. Yeah. I think it was affectation, actually. Do you? <laughs> um, and I have, I have, not with the opposite, but I have the birth certificates of both of the... Uh, of the boys? boys yes. Ah. David. I couldn't find them. Well, that's good. They existed. So I, I think they're currently in the garage in Western Superman. That's a long story. <laughs> Both Gordon Pask and Stafford Beer were proud of their part in creating the laws of form. Both ended up fervently wishing to have nothing to do with the man. In later life, I was on the brink of having a major quarrel with Spence Brown, and I asked Stafford if he'd mind if I broke with him. And Stafford just roared with laughter and said he wouldn't care if he never saw the man again. <laughs> How do I do this without... Okay. What, what? You can just go left and right on the arrow. Please. Oh, OK. On the keyboard, right? Yes. Yeah. Very simple. That's not what I was after. Oof, sorry. Close it, do I? Oh, yeah. This portrait is The portrait which you just showed. Yes, yeah, of Gordon. Taken, I think it's taken by Lord. No, of uh, Max Spencer Brown. Oh, yes, the top I, one, I Barney. Think that, I think that was taken by Lord Snowden. Really? Yeah. It's a terrific photo. Yeah. Oh. So, the thing I am looking for is not here. Damn it. Sorry, I've, I've made some errors in copying things. What I wanted to show you was. Uh, a copy of the hieroglyphic monad, but he'll have to do. So the hieroglyphic monad frontispiece, um, which I became very interested in, and I kept hearing overtones of the laws of form in it. 
I don't know why, and thinking to do some kind of comparative study. You all know the hieroglyphic monad, John D. Uh, yeah, Elizabeth I, uh, court magician, astrologer, alchemist, that's, mathematician. That's very funny that you should mention that because Maxwell has always somehow reminded me of Dr. D. Well, there's, there's something quite sort of not I'll tell you why. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I asked, uh, I decided I'd do a portrait of Spence Brown. This is a cheap and easy way to get to um, be in touch with people. So uh, David Whitaker, we all know David Whitaker, bookseller par excellence. Um, he knows everybody in systems and cybernetics. And so he gave me Spence Brown's phone number. And I asked if I could do his portrait. And he asked no questions. He said, he did not say who has commissioned this or for whom. He would expect portraits to be his due. <laughs> so he didn't ask any of those questions. What he said was, where and what will the temperature be? <laughs> his body would not permit a temperature of less than whatever it was. And I think he may have thought he was posing nude, but I don't know. <laughs> so we talked a bit, and since I was Stafford's daughter, and he mentioned the Nature Review, um, not the sponsoring or the employment, he agreed to meet with me. So, like any first date, I plumped for a public space and we arranged to meet in the first hall of the entrance of the National Gallery uh, in, in Trafalgar Square. And, of course, he was instantly recognisable. I'd never seen a picture of him, but, you know, the brown sandals without socks and the air of genius. So we talked and we got on fine and we agreed to press on with the portrait. And then I asked him, I said, what was the relationship with the hieroglyphic monad. And he immediately said, who's John D? <laughs> it's a complete comeback, who's John D? So that was a bit fruitless, really, from my point of view. So my studio was in Woolwich in the southeast of London, and Spencer, Fra Spencer Brown refused to travel that far. So then I found a studio that fulfilled all of his expectations. It belonged to my friend Bernard Heslin, and he cleared it for me. It was in Denmark Street, and it was warm and perfect. So arrangements continued by telephone. Things looked set when Spencer Brown decided he would not come. Instead, he wanted the thing done at his place, so we agreed on a compromise. I'd do the preliminary drawings at his home, start the picture in my studio, finish up with him at a final session in the Denmark Street studio. So, in December of 1997, I went to North London with my drawing kit. 18A Gren Greville Place, Northwest 6. I found Spencer Brown in a ground floor flat, which I thought was rather grand. It was this sort of apartment, you knew it, yeah. Yeah, very, very posh yeah. in my terms. Yeah. <laughs> um, sorry, um, I want to close this one. Let's put up another one. Well, good question, um, whoever asked that. I have no idea. He had an inheritance from his mother oh, around right. that, that time and hadn't uh, lost all of it in the casino uh, 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 by that time. And later he was on uh, social security. Oh, la, la, la. So, yes, I was impressed. Who knows what mathematicians are? And I didn't have a clue. So alarm bells started in my head when he let me in. First thing he did was to treble lock that front door. I grant I was a 40-year-old woman, but you know, I didn't know what I was dealing with. And he had heavy security grills over the doors and windows, great squidgy things, they, I don't know what you call them. He, they were he, all locked. He, um, one evening when he was going home, a thug crept in behind him and pushed the door open. Oh, and no. threatened him with a knife throughout the night, um, demanding money and stuff. And, uh, oh, poor chap. So that was the result. It was a very, very harrowing experience. Mm. So possibly it was after that. Uh, after that yes, episode. yes. Well, he talked to me a lot about his enemies. He thought his enemies were after him. Yeah. But perhaps he thought the thug was a byproduct of a... You, you went through a paranoid phase mm. right about that time. So. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I learnt that any very important people have enemies and I couldn't hope to understand what they were. <laughs> And I learnt that his genius compelled him to work all the time, that he had lately achieved some major breakthroughs in mathematics. And by the way, was my father still a professor? Was he still working? Could he get him a chair somewhere? <laughs> he didn't mind teaching, though he would only do it naked. 
months. <laughs> so I gabbled through two quick drawings and uh, thought he wouldn't like them. Um, this is not it, one of them. And this was the flattering version I did. I thought, if I did a quick flattering, you know, that might get me out in one piece. And he seemed to be tiring, and, and maybe he hadn't slept. So I said I was okay, he didn't even want to see them, and he let me out. So I vowed I'd never be alone with him again, uh, which wasn't a bad resolution. That's the other one. He put on the TV and watched something. I don't know if it was a, a, a movie that was on the telly. Uh, it's called A New Leaf. It was something he seemed to be very fond of that he was watching. You mean anything? Uh, I think uh, that's not a film with either... I was doing him, not watching the box, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It may, it, that was a film that he was very fond of, but I think it's got a similar, similar name to that. Okay. I can't remember it clearly now. But so after that, he rang me from lots of evenings, although we never ever mentioned the portrait again. So I guessed he was lonely. He'd drink early evening puffing away on a cigar and then talk to me about his genius. And he was very interesting, and I got very fond of him. But it was kind of annoying not having anything to contribute. Nevertheless, I learned he was Wittgenstein's lover in, wow. in my queer phase. He called it in my queer phase. I was Wittgenstein. Well, when he was at Cambridge, he was, and I quote him, tremendously homosexual. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I didn't know that he was Wittgenstein's lover. Well, that's what he told me, yeah, and I didn't half pick up my he, ears. He didn't, he didn't tell me that. Yeah. I do know some stories, <laughs> liaisons that he had with people now living, but I can't mention... No, you're not mentioning no names, yes. So, and uh, that he taught maths to Ber Bertrand Russell, which, as he said, was very difficult because he had to unlearn um, Russell's maths, undo all of Principia Mathematica. <laughs> he told me he was a fellow of both Oxford and Cambridge, with dining rights in each, though I can't remember the colleges, if he ever said, and of course, Ronnie Lang was an intimate. He talked of his engines, calculating engines, perhaps computers, I never found out. He told stories of fires, how places went to flames around him, how he had to climb out of windows and escape with his engines. I learnt he was not a mathematician, though people thought he was. After much thought, he decided he was a magician. He set his mind and called answers into being. This is what a magician was, ago. He was a magician. Mostly, if I contributed anything, I was a very stupid woman. You really are a very stupid woman, was his favorite response if I interrupted him with some observation. Well, it wasn't personal, he was a Oh, yes, I, I realized that. <laughs> So the apex of my stupidity occurred after he explained his success in solving the twin primes conjecture and the Goldbe Goldback conjecture. So I told my friend and then employer, Tony Mann. Tony was head of math stats and comps in Greenwich University back in the day. He's now head of maths. You may know him. Anyway, I told Tony that the conjectures were sorted, and he was very excited. <laughs> So I told Spencer Brown how exciting his work was to other mathematicians. <laughs> Who had I spoken to? Didn't I realize this was secret work? <laughs> if he had known I knew other mathematicians, he would not have told me. <laughs> they steal his work, his enemies. So he demanded Tony's phone number and said he'd ring him immediately. So I got to Tony the minute the phone was down and warned him. I, I told him to take his phone off the hook, but, <laughs> but Tony dealt with him. He's okay. He got shouted at, but that was it. So, do you all know Tim Robinson's book, uh, My Time in Space? It's a it's lovely book. He was the guy who did the technical illustrations for The Laws of Form. Oh, didn't yeah, Tim Robinson, he's lovely. And the book, uh, he has several, but his book, My Time in Space, talks of his relationship with Spencer Brown. Um, he says, sometimes I tried to hang up on him, but he was always quicker on the draw. And while I was still aiming a Parthian shot, I would hear the decisive click of his receiver. And my phone calls were similar. David Whitaker, the bookseller, 
um, told me he rang Spencer Brown about a book order, and Spencer Brown demanded he got off the line. He was waiting for a call from the Nobel Prize Committee. <laughs> uh, given that Nobel didn't offer a prize for maths, one wonders. One, one, one wonders. He certainly wouldn't have won it for peace. <laughs> So our penultimate call was very one-sided. It was June the 9th in 2001. It was my wedding day. My girlfriends were dressing me in preparation for the trip to the town hall. One of them answered the phone. <laughs> Having established it was Professor Spencer Brown, I yelled at her, Annie Hayes, to, to tell him I couldn't talk now because I was getting dressed to be married. So Annie was on the phone, you know, the rest of us getting on with it, and she's going, uh, yes, mm -hmm, oh. and uh, she's flapping her free hand, going like this at the phone, and finally put down the phone and said, who was that madman? And he told her that I should not be getting married, I should be marrying him. <laughs> so the last phone call wasn't so entertaining. I rang him on a big birthday, I can't remember which, and found him very unhappy. He said he lived in hell. The cottage he lived in was owned by the Marquis, how do you say that, Marquis? Mar Marcus. Marcus of Bath, Bath, yes. Who was oh. tutored at Cambridge by oh, Spencer. Correct, yeah. yeah. that's what he said. He um, sent flowers to his funeral, actually. Oh, did he? Oh, yeah, I met him. Oh, oh how I nice, because I wanted to contact him and didn't give myself enough time. Oh, that's very nice to know. He invited me to the big house, as it's from Ooh, yes. Oh, well, very nice. So anyway, um, the, um, they'd fall into fighting, and Spencer Brown explained to me that there could only be one king after this battle, only one king on the estate, and this meant a fight to the death. Lord Bath had refused to return his calls, and his lackeys kept them apart. It all seemed most desperate. And I clung to the belief that he would be telling a different tale the next day, but I never rang again. You know, I couldn't handle it. So, back to the question of who was Spencer Brown. Well, we've all dealt with all this, although Tim Robinson refers to the brother, as described by George, as the Mycroft-like figure with an uncanny degree of intelligence and a certain remoteness from the actual. Um, the, yes, that's quite, quite nice, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's good book, the um, thingy book. I've got a photo here of Spencer Brown in a boat with someone allegedly his brother, but I haven't got it with me. I don't know why not. So, um, Elena Leonard, Stafford's partner, she says, Spencer Brown worked at Sigma and was fired very soon after Stafford left. He turned up at IPC, told Stafford he needed a job until he could finish the book. He did finish it. Stafford said after a few weeks he had to go. Spence Brown sued Stafford for wrongful dismissal. The IPC lawyers told Stafford he didn't have a leg to stand on. That was that. This is Elena speaking. I don't know if anyone knew for sure, but I think he used both David and George, saying they were twins. Perhaps one died at birth, suggests Elena. But no. It occurs to me that Stafford may have known the name, but not the man. So David worked at Sigma and George appeared at IPC? Possibly. Um, I, know that, I know that David and George both worked for Sigma at one point. George got uh, David a job there, so he told me. Okay. Um, so George was first in. And then yes. <laughs> I didn't no, realize David his brother was working on statistics. I think that uh, David was working uh, with George on logic design. Right. Golly. Um, so Gloria Gillett, who I, I spoke to a lot about this, she says, my memory is of only one Spencer Brown, the one employed at Sigma, as Stafford had known him and thought he would be an interesting addition to the company. I seem to think that Stafford wanted to help him in some way, she says. Mm -hmm. So then finally I did the sensible thing and Googled who was G. Spencer Brown. <laughs> Fantastic, isn't it? A site curated by Larry Barnett of the artist Kurt von Meyer, with an account by Walter Barney, whom we touched on yesterday, of a conference at Big Sur with John Lilly, Alan Watts, Heinz von Forser, Ram Dass, Je Ge Jeffrey Bateson, Gregory Bateson, sorry. And it looks sensational. So we, we touched on this yesterday. Lilly introduced Brown as more of an amigo than, Charles, than Carlos Castaneda. In so much as the form of an enigma, in so much as the form of an enigma manifests the enigma 
Brown fits the description perfectly. G for George, Virgil's Joetics, songs of husbandry, hence husband, male principal, Spencer the dispenser, Brown's seventh color, seventh tarot key, the chariot, the mind, the new man. G. Spencer Brown, also known as James, the King James version. Keys, key, a wedge, prob, probably akin to, oh God, and so it goes. You know, there's a, there's a very poetic um, response to meeting him. A wise man from the East, that is to say, England. So he's thoroughly Western, maybe the first hierophant of the mind since Newton to insist on the tandem yoking together of male science and logic with female art and religion. Spencer Brown insisted on that, didn't he? <laughs> with the intellectual clout to, to command a serious audience. So, um, where are we? This, this is all unnecessary. There's this book right on the table <coughs> called More About David. Oh, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Was that uh, about uh, uh, David, his brother, or David uh, George? Uh, no, uh, neither, uh, I think. I just found it amongst his, his possessions. Um, and I've, I've got no idea who, who the David is, but it's not his brother. Because in the book it says that um, the, the, the David in question went to Eden, but I'm absolutely certain that the brother didn't go to Eden. So... Uh, it would be surprising, yeah. So how many names do we have now? We have George Brown as the young maths lecturer, George Spencer Brown, the writer of The Laws of Form, George Spencer Brown, writer of the later editions of Laws of Form, and possibly David Spencer Brown, untimely death in 76. Then there's Richard Leroy, Richard de Vere, and James Keyes. The man himself, in the appendix of the German edition of 1997, writes that... You came into this world with nothing and were assigned a value by being given a name, dependent on which all other names then had meaning. Change your name, change your meaning. And among cyberneticians, Anthony Stafford Beer became just Stafford Beer. Ro William Ross Ashby became Ross Ashby. William Gray Walter became Gray Walter. Andrew Gordon Pask became Gordon Pask. Could have been a fashion. It was Andrew Pickering um, from the Cybernetic Brain Book who, who pointed out this trend among British cyberneticians to <laughs> change their name. So was this book a cybernetic construct? Not this one, The Laws of Form. Only the brain of Spencer Brown could have produced The Laws of Form. I think we all agree on that. Um, and only he could have persuaded Beer and Pask to enable the task. I don't know how, but that they were cyberneticians could have been a happy chance, but it's hard to think of another genre of persons who would have gone out on such a limb to pull the book into being. So my last words are George Spencer Brown's signing himself Richard Leroy, a poem he sent me called Our Immortality. Are we to blame for what happens after we are dead? We are. We leave behind a trail of vanity of what we taught, rewritten for any kind of fool. If we weren't so keen to give our name to it, this false trail leading nowhere need never have been left. That's the lot. Any questions? Yes, I think I have. Uh, yes, name. yes, I think I have his passport. Under what name? <laughs> oh, under George. George. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. All, all official documentation was under was was under George. George Brown. George, uh, George Brown. When he was a child, uh, his um, uh, birth certificate has George Brown on it. But as an adult, George Spencer Brown. Right. Mm. This is a comment about the name business. Uh, uh, many years ago, I wrote an article and called some algebras Browning. And uh, he wrote back, he wrote to me, and he said, I don't mind if you call algebras Brownian, but you must refer to me as Spencer Brown, 
How would you like it if I were to refer to you as F man? <laughs> but isn't there, um, I mean, where does Brownian motion come from? Isn't there a rival? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, yeah. you'd be aware of that. Yeah. And, and yeah. it's subsequently paranoid. Yeah. <laughs> How would he end up having his portrait taken by Lord Snowden? Uh, I think he commissioned it. <laughs> yeah, I, I believe so. Yeah. Also, just just out of interest, the um, a new leaf is the 1971 comedy. Oh, thank you. American with Walter Matthau. Yeah. Oh, well done. And uh, the brief synopsis: a spoiled and self-absorbed man who has squandered who has squandered his inheritance. He's desperate to find a way to maintain his lavish lifestyle. Wow! <laughs> <laughs> on, on the money. <laughs> the money. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, re maybe relevant to you, it says, it goes on to say, sees an opportunity when he meets an awkward and bookish heiress. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. That's fantastic. I only know because I've written it. That's fantastic. It. It says, uh, I don't know if you can read what I've written. Um, I'm not sure I can either. Uh, Spencer Brown, date, watching a new leaf. A new leaf. Yeah. I, I don't know what yeah. possessed me to write that, except yeah. perhaps his air of absorption. Yeah. <laughs> Good thing you didn't write. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Wait, no. Uh, so, a question about, uh, or rather, a comment about names. Uh, wait, In conversation with me over the phone, uh, Spencer Brown was very insistent that his uh, systems were not called Brownian but Spencerian. He didn't want to be confused with Brownian version. Yeah, yeah. And he was also very uh, touchy about people calling it the laws of form. It should be laws of form. Okay, okay. Well, I, I never knew what to call him myself, so I called him Professor, and this went down terribly well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how that's how he's known in Horningsham, the Professor. The Professor, yeah. yes. Right. Are we done? All right, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much.